Good morning and welcome to the Sunday School here at Flat Springs Baptist Church. I'm Jack Marks. I'm a teacher of the young youth class. So therefore our courtly does not follow the norm and so you won't be able to uh, follow what we have been doing for the last several Sundays. But uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share this Sunday School lesson. Thank you, Father, for the lesson writer, and thank you that we are able to share it via YouTube, and thank you for Jimmy that will prepare this lesson for viewing. I pray, Father, it will be satisfactory to you and a blessing to those viewing. Amen. The title of the lesson, there's, uh, as it breaks down, is The Practice of Godliness. Every year after Christmas rush is over, and a lot of people start looking and thinking about the new year. And a lot of them start making resolutions. Did you make a resolution for 2020? If so, did it have anything to do with something that would improve your physical health? Maybe you decided you would start doing some exercise. Maybe start walking. Maybe start jogging. Uh, maybe you decided you would join a gym. Maybe you decided not to do the exercise, but maybe you started a diet. Or maybe you were just going to change your eating habits. Maybe you cut out sugar. Or stop drinking so many soft drinks. Maybe you set a goal to lose X number of pounds. How's that working out for you? Maybe you stop uh, using tobacco products. Maybe get more sleep. If you can say, yeah, I, I said that, or you are doing any of that, it means that you're concerned about your physical health. Apparently, there are a lot of people concerned about their physical health. Because the way I understand it, the exercise equipment industry is a billion dollar industry. Sadly to say, a lot of that is bought and then turns into being a clothes hanger. Think about how many gyms are in Sanford. There, you don't buy the equipment, you just pay them to use theirs. And Sanford's not a big city. You wonder how many people are in those gyms on Sunday morning working on their physical health. But on the other hand, there are people that don't care about their physical health. They eat what they want, they drink what they want. And when they get sick and have to go to the doctor, they don't even take the doctor's advice. My daddy used to say, if you go to the doctor and you pay what they charge, then at least do what they tell you to do. My parents and their parents they did not go to the doctor every time they stomped their toe. Well, shoot. Actually, myself and my brothers and my sister didn't get to go either. Our parents were some of the best in the world, but unless you were in bad shape, you didn't go to the doctor. They used a lot of home remedies. Must work. All four of us are still here. Money was tight. Didn't have the insurance like you can today. And doctors won't cheat. My grandma, Claudia Covert, used to say that all doctors and lawyers were going to hell because they charged so much. And my grandma, I want you to know, was a Christian woman. She was a lifetime member of this church here at Flat Springs. She's buried in the cemetery. And I'm sure she's walking with the saints in heaven. I can only hope for the doctors and lawyers that she was referring to. Anyway, moving on before I get in trouble, how about your spiritual health? Did you make a resolution to improve your spiritual health? Is, if so, have you kept it? Are you concerned about your spiritual health? Are you working out in that area? Do you do anything to improve your spiritual health daily? Do you go to your spiritual doctor, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? 
And if so, do you listen to him and take his advice? Well, we're going to find out what the scripture says about all this. The lesson today finds Paul informing Timothy and Titus to stay strong in their faith and to work or work out at improving themselves spiritually. Timothy, who is the son of Eunice and grandson of Lois, is in the large city of Ephesus, assisting the church leaders and members. And Titus is doing the same on the island of Crete. Our first scripture is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And I'll be reading from the Living Bible. It says, But the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times some in the church will turn away from Christ and become eager followers of teachers with devil-inspired ideas. These teachers will tell lies with straight faces and do it so often that their consciences won't even bother them. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat meat, even though God gave these things to well-taught Christians to enjoy and be thankful for. For everything God made is good, and we may eat it gladly if we are thankful for it. And if we ask God to bless it, for it is made good by the word of God in prayer. If you explain this to the others, you will be doing your duty as a worthy pastor who is fed by faith and by the true teaching you have followed. Don't waste time arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. Spend your time and energy in the exercise of keep, keeping spiritually fit. Bodily exercise is all right, but spiritual exercise is much more important and is a tonic for all you do. So exercise yourself spiritually and practice being a better Christian because that will help you not only now in this life, but in the next life too. This is the truth, and everyone should accept it. We work hard and suffer much in order that people will believe it, for our hope is in the living God who died for all, and particularly for those who have accepted his salvation. Paul is telling them to keep their time, or spend their time and energy keeping spiritually fit. He tells Timothy to separate himself from the false teachers. He tells Timothy everything created by God is good when received with thanksgiving. He is assuring Timothy that the leaders that were saying that from abstaining from marriage and certain foods would not remove their sins. He tells Timothy to train in godliness. Just as we train physically, we are also supposed to train spiritually. Paul recommends to Timothy and to us that we are to train others by setting examples. Five areas for examples. Our speech. Have you ever met somebody you didn't know before, introduced to them? And usually within that first five minutes of conversation, you're beginning to sum up the person based strictly off of their vocabulary and how they conduct themselves in speech. In conduct, how we treat each other. In love, in faith, in purity. It has been said, you are what you eat. The same, I think, could be said for our lives. We are by what we do and how we live. I ask you, though, how can we tell and show others about our Lord and Savior if we don't know him? When I was growing up, I liked to build model cars and had not built any for several years. My wife was a collector of Coca-Cola stuff, and I was in a store, and they had a model pickup. Coca-Cola decals when you got through with it. So I bought it, bought some glue, and sat down and put it together for her, and painted it and put the decals on it. So I got back in an old hobby, and I still do it. Uh, not very good at it, but I still enjoy it. I had a friend of mine tell me one time I built one to give it to him. He said, I, I, I built five foot models. And I said, what do you mean five foot models? He said, well, they look good from five foot away. So uh, I do not claim to be a professional. But I said all of that to say that 
I knew of a fella that opened a store, a hobby store. You have to go in, buy your models, get your glue. And he opened it, but he didn't know his product. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know anything about models. You just buy the model and put it together. But he didn't know anything about the rest of the store that much. And these guys that go in and buy model airplanes and these cars and boats that are RV controlled and radio controlled and stuff, they have questions and they have things they needed to know and he couldn't do he couldn't answer that. The bottom line is he didn't know his product and he didn't stay in business. He only opened it as a business venture, as a franchise. A salesman has to know his product. So the question is, are we prepared to sell others on Jesus? Do we know our product? The next part of the scripture is out of Titus, and Paul was sending a letter to Titus. 1 through 7. Remind your people to obey the government and its officers, and always to be obedient and ready for any honest work. They must not speak evil of anyone, nor quarrel, but be gentle and truly courteous to all. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled by others and became slaves to many evil pleasures and wicked desires. Our lives were full of resentment and envy. We hated others and they hated us. But when the time came for the kindness and love of our God, of our Savior to appear, then he saved us, not because we were good enough to be saved, but because of his kindness and pity by washing away our sins and giving us the new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us with wonderful fullness, and all because of what Jesus Christ our Savior did, so that we could declare, he could declare us good in God's eyes, all because of his great kindness and now we can share in the wealth of the eternal life he gives us. And we are eagerly looking forward to receiving it. Paul's letter to Titus is very much like the letter he sent to Timothy. He tells him about how the church members should be and be aware of false teachings. Paul and Titus had been on missionary trips together before. And in fact, Paul and Titus were, with, were together on Crete. And Paul left him there to minister to the churches. Uh, and he addresses his letter to Paul. He thought, Paul thought a lot of both Timothy and Titus. And I wanted to point out to Titus, uh, if you back up to the first chapter, verse 4, it says the letter was addressed to Titus, who is truly my son in the affairs of the Lord. The research that I looked up, Titus is actually in his teenage years at this time, uh, and that's quite an undertaking to be a teenager doing what he was doing on the island of Crete, but Paul had confidence in him. He tells Titus to live a life so that others would know he knows the Lord. We should do likewise. We are a walking and talking display of God's love. And then in verse 3, go back to, or chapter 3, go back to verse 8 and 9. It says, These things I have told you are all true. Insist on them so that Christians will be careful to do good deeds all the time. For well, this is not only right, but it brings results. Don't ever get involved in arguing over unanswerable questions and controversial theological ideas. Keep out of arguments and quarrels about obedience to Jewish laws. For this kind of thing isn't worthwhile. It only does harm. Paul tells Titus to insist on these things. He tells, uh, he wanted to make sure that the new Christians clearly understood the instructions on godliness. They are to vote themselves to good works and to avoid foolish debates and quarrels and disputes about the law. Paul tells Titus and us, if we have been saved, our life should reflect that. We are on display. We are to use our time, our talents, 
and our treasures for God's good works. This shows the world our devotion to God. To be physically fit, we have to work out. To be spiritually fit, we have to work out. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your brother Paul. Thank you for his godly wisdom and advice. Help us, Father, to realize that Paul's letter applies to us today just as it did to Timothy and Titus. Help us to heed the advice and work out spiritually so that others will see you in us. Amen.